Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Eurogen webinar series. I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the manager of the Reference Network. So just before we get started, I'd like to take a couple of minutes uh, to give you an idea of what the Reference Network is and does. Well, Eurogen is one of 24 reference networks which cover all different medical fields and they were created by the European Commission in 2017. They're also kindly funded by the European Commission. And Eurogen uh, covers the field of rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. And they're usually patients who need highly specialised surgery. So really where the expertise is rare. And we're currently a network of 51 healthcare providers in 20 member states. So all the highly specialised surgeons are collaborating to help improve care for patients with those rare and complex diseases. So some of the activities that we cover in our reference network, well, I hope, as you saw from the introductory slides, we um, organise virtual consultations. So European level MDTs, if you like where we can link together the experts in our hospitals who can give their advice on a particularly tricky case. So this is, uh, this is easy to do, um, it's free of charge, so I would strongly encourage you to get in touch if you're in a healthcare provider in an EU member state and you would like some advice on a patient with a disease um, in some of the areas that we cover. Um, secondly, we also uh, collaborate on training and education activities together and we also very excitingly have a patient registry which is now operational. So we're gradually adding more and more data of these patients into the registry and the hope is over at least 25 years we'll have a long term view of how the improvements for our patients are working. So we all know the data is fragmented, scattered all over Europe, and there's pockets of it in different countries, but no one country alone has enough data on patients with rare diseases to really produce substantial evidence. So we hope by linking that all together at a European level, we'll really have the clinical real-time world data um, to do some exciting research in the future. And uh, the other thing we do is collaborate on clinical guidelines and clinical decision support tools, again, in our areas. Um, so that's what we do. Please don't hesitate to get in touch if you are at all interested. Um, and then now tonight's webinar is on urological issues in anorectal malformations. And it's part of our special colorectal series of the webinars. Um, and they're produced in collaboration with another ERN, Ernica, and also with some of our supporting partners, the ARMNET and also the European Paediatric Surgeons Association. So we're very grateful to them for collaborating with us. Uh, so tonight, it's a great honour. We first of all have a recorded presentation from Dr. Lisbeth Duval, and she's a paediatric urologist in Radboud University Medical Centre. And then we also have a presentation following that by Dr. Anna Morandi, and she's a paediatric pedi surgeon from the Fondazione IRCCS, Grande Ospedale Maggiore Policlinico Milano. Um, and she's going to do a deeper dive into epidemiitis. Um, so she'll cover a little bit more detail about that and then she'll answer questions at the end. So again, I would encourage you to send through any questions at the end. So without further ado, uh, thank you to our pre presenters for sharing their expertise with us this evening, and I hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you very much. Good night. Welcome. I'm very pleased and honoured to be involved as a speaker in ARN uh, Eurogen webinars, together with my colleague, Dr. Morandi. Uh, however, at this very moment, I'm attending a funeral abroad, so this is a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, in my last slide, before Dr. Morandi will take over, I will show you my email address. Uh, so if any questions arise throughout my presentation, please feel free to email me and I will respond as soon as possible. There are no conflicts of interest. 
Uh, during this webinar, several topics will be presented. I'll discuss the incidence of urological anomalies in patients with ARM, the screening methods used and the outcomes of implementation in daily practice based on recent publication on this topic. We'll also discuss low urinary tract dysfunction and sexual dysfunction on the long term in patients corrected for ARM in infancy. And we'll talk about uh, urological anomalies in patients with Hirschsprung. Uh, Dr. Morandi will discuss the association between ARM and epidemia orchitis and focusing on uh, possible risk factors and the results from the ARM net consortium. Urological anomalies are frequently seen in patients with ARM with an overall incidence varying between the 20 to 50 percent. And the level of the position of the fistula is associated with the percentage of urological involvement. And in general, the more complex the ARM, the higher percentage of associated urogenital um, anomalies. In patients with rectal bladder fistula or cloaca malformations, for example, the urogenital involvement is as high as 90 to 100%, which decreases as the level of the fistula decreases. And like shown in the figure, in girls with cloacal malformation, urinary retention is likely to occur due to hydrometrocolpus, which should be taken care of immediately after birth. Ultrasound will show a distended vagina which contains urine and bilateral urethral obstruction at the level of the trigone. Um, and we also know that hydrometrocolpus is associated reduce, with reduced fertility on the long term due to infection and scarring. When the level of the fistula is more distally and from a surgical point of view considered less complex, like in the vestibular or the perineal fistula, the incidence is lower but can still reach up to 35 and 40 percent. The most common urological uh, findings are uh, the, hydromet the hydronephrosis, seen in 30 to 75 percent. High-grade fur, which is seen in up to 23%, and a solitary kidney varying between 6 to 25%. And what we also see, are, which is common in the uh, normal population as well, is of course the undescendant testes and the hyperspadias. It's well established that all patients with ARM undergo a systematic factal screening, including screening for urological anomalies. However, the extent and methods used to screen for these anomalies differ with the complexity of the ARM, but also within different centers. And recently, two interesting articles were published by the group of Avon and Barnes from Melbourne, Australia, and the group of Beaufort from the Netherlands. They both studied the completeness of screening follow local implementation of standardized protocols in their centers. And they analyzed respective, uh, respectively 127 and 260 patients, and they found out that 15 to 25 percent of their patients did not have a full screening, despite the implementation of the standardized protocol. And the group in Australia also found that patients with a complex ARM, those with the bladder neck fistula, the rectal prostatic fistula, or the cloacal ARMs, had 100 percent factal screening, but only. 67% uh, had a complete screening of the Lex complex ARM. And furthermore, they found out that those with a perineal fistula revealed almost 50% cardiac anomalies and 36% of renal anomalies, which potentially can cause long term problems if being unnoticed. So we are all aware about the high percentage of urologic anomalies in children with complex ARM. But both these studies support the importance of routine screening in all patients with ARM. And there are in general several screening methods available. Ultrasound, VCUG, cystoscopy and urodynamic studies. And in the next slides I will present the case and try to discuss reasons to do either one or two or more of those screening methods. So I would like to present a girl born after gestational age of 39 weeks. It's the first child of this mother and she had a good start. After birth, a physical examination revealed an ARM with a vestibular fistula. On further physical examination, no abnormalities were seen and a nasogastric tube was placed without any problems. She was able to pass her meconium within 24 hours and with calibration 8, uh, 
the fistula was easy to pass, so at that time no colostomy was given and parents were thought to calibrate twice and she was planned for absorb later on. Here are the results of her fucktail screening. We see the ultrasound of the kidneys and the bladder and both kidneys show a normal aspect with normal length and no dilation of the phylum or calyces. What's nice to see in these pictures is the very clear corticomedular differentiation with the medulla containing a lot of water as the collecting tubes of the nephrons are localized here. On ultrasound, therefore, it's more echogenic and it's easily mistaken for dilated calyces by inexperienced sonographists. The bladder in this child had a normal asp aspect without ureters visible behind the bladder and the ultrasound of the spinal cord uh, showed a normal position uh, without signs of tethering. In addition, an x-ray of the sacrum and the spine were made. A normal aspect was seen of the thoracic spine and the ribs. The lumbar region was a little bit more difficult uh, because of, to interpret because of the enteral air and the sacral um, x-ray showed a hypoplasia of S3 and S2. So I would like the, uh, the audience to take a brief moment and I would like to know whether you would do a VCUG or not and to think about the argumentations whether to perform or not to perform a VCUG for yourself. We did a VCUG, which uh, we'll discuss in the next slides, but first discuss the pro and cons of performing a VCUG in patients with ARM. And one of the reasons you might have considered for yourself is that a normal ultrasound was seen with a normal aspect of the kidneys and the bladder. So uh, there were no signs of dilation, so you should not have to perform a VCUG. And of course, the less radiation exposure, the better. The procedure itself can be stressful for both parents and the child. And despite the fact that maybe you know that, maybe you don't, but up to 30% of uh, vesicle ureter reflux can be missed or can be uh, uh, there despite a normal ultrasound, would it have any therapeutic implications? And reasons to perform a VCUGR is that, of course, you can miss 30% uh, of occult uh, vesicle ureter reflux present. And in this case, oh, pardon me. In this case, there's might uh, there's a hypoplasia of her sacrum, which uh, might suggest that a neurogenic bladder is present, which can uh, give concomitant vesicle ureter reflux. Um, what we also know in patients born with a neurogenic bladder, like those with by bifid spine, is that they um, most often have a normal ultrasound at the time of birth, but we also know that 60% of them develop upper urinary tract changes due to either vesicle ureter reflux and or urinary tract infections. And if they are not treated appropriately, 50% of them develop uh, end-stage renal kidney failure. The VCUG results are shown here. Um, quite a smooth bladder wall but there is vesicle ureter reflux grade two to the right side. So another brief moment of overthinking, who would start prophylactic antibiotics, why and or why not? Arguments in favor of antibiotics are the young age, the female gender, the vestibular fistula, which makes her more vulnerable for UTI, and the question that we do not really know whether or not she's having a neurogenic bladder yet. Arguments against antibiotics are the grade 2 physical ureter reflux, the fact that the VCU gene was done after the PSAR procedure, I didn't mention that, but it was the case, which of course made her less vulnerable for UTI because of closure of the fistula, and the outcomes of the Cochrane trial published in 2019, <coughs> where um, their conclusion is that long-term antibiotics did not protect the kidneys from scarring to, due to UTI. However, the methodological design of most studies in this review and the literature are questionable, and lack of robust uh, randomized controlled trial limits the 
uh, strength of their conclusions. So up till now in our urological guidelines, uh, we give prophylactic antibiotics in patients with high risk factors like those with a young age, high grade uh, vesicle yeast reflux, but also in females and uh, those with neurogenic bladder or low urinary tract dysfunction. So we started prophylactic antibiotics in this girl and we did a follow-up ultrasound at the age of one year. And like shown, there are no anomalies seen, normal kidneys, no dilation and a smooth bladder wall. Meanwhile, she was doing fine. There were no signs of low urinary tract dysfunction uh, and she didn't develop any UTIs in between. But parents were reluctant to give antibiotics for a long term, so we repeated the VCUG. And as you can see, the aspect of the bladder wall uh, at the time of the VCUG at birth, uh, it changed dramatically at the time of the VCUG at one year's age with a lot of trabeculation which um, confirms the diagnosis of, or as, uh, at least the sus susceptibility of a neurogenic bladder, which was confirmed in her with urodynamic studies. So we started intermediate catheterization and antimuscarinic treatment. So this case shows us that we always have to be aware uh, for development of neurogenic bladder in patients with ARM and spinal anomalies, despite a normal ultrasound at the start. So we have to do a proper follow-up, um, and I think patients with a spinal anomaly also always deserve a VCUG and a regular follow-up by a pediatric urologist. As previously mentioned, uh, vesicle reflux is a common finding in patients with ARM, and especially high-grade vesicle reflux is associated with additional risk for fibril UTIs and subsequent renal scarring hypertension and, of course, ultimately renal failure. So therefore, it's interesting to see if screening for vesicle urethral reflux in the first place is regularly performed throughout the expertise centers in Europe. And this slide presents the results of a study performed in 27 centers across 11 European countries, all connected to the ARM net consortium, and a total of 2,500 patients were included for analysis. The results show us that renal scaring, uh, screening was performed in uh, almost all patients, 90%, but uh, VCUG was done in only 32%, um, ranging from 25% in the less complex to 43% uh, in the high complex ARM. Um, in addition, there was a large variation in whether or not the VCUG was performed in the first place, uh, and it differed across the participating center from 6% to 55%. High-grade fur was seen in 90% and clinically high-grade fur uh, with a normal ultrasound was seen in 10% of the patients. Um, so in 10 patients with a normal ultrasound, one will have high-grade fur despite uh, uh, no abnormality seen at the ultrasound and high-grade fur is uh, having a therapeutic implication. At least that's how we treat it so far, according to the guidelines. So based on these results, the authors suggest to make a VCUG a standard part of the screening in patients with ARM, despite the type of the ARM and findings of the ultrasound. And up till now, we've mainly talked about anatomical anomalies like the reflux and whether or not a VCUG should be part of routine screening in patients with ARM, but in this slide I would like to address the more functional urological outcomes as well, like low urinary tract symptoms, urinary incontinence and sexual outcome. And in 2021 a systematic review was published by a group in Denmark to, de to determine the overall prevalence of urinary and sexual dysfunctions in patients who have been corrected for the ARM more than 10 years ago at infancy. And a total of 17 studies out of 588 were included, uh, and the majority of the studies were performed in Europe. And they found a combined prevalence for urinary incontinence of 16%. And in high ARM, it was varying between 11 to 22, but in low ARM, it was also 11%. Lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, either due or not due to a neurogenic bladder, was uh, seen in. 
and there was uh, one study where they reported LUTs uh, with or without the presence or absence of spinal anomalies, and they found in, uh, LUTs in, present in 85% of the patients with spinal anomalies and 65% without spinal anomalies. That, that was not significantly different. Sexual dysfunction in female ARM assessed by the Female Sexual Function Index questionnaire was as high as 50%, even in females with a low ARM, and overall uh, erectile dysfunction and ejaculatory dysfunction was seen uh, in 12 to 60 percent of the patients. And these results emphasize the importance of long-term follow-up with attention for both urological and sexual outcomes. The last topic I'm going to discuss is the prevalence of urogenital anomalies in patients with Hirschsprung, because it's frequently underestimated. Two centers in Italy included all consecutive patients with Hirschsprung between 2005 and 2020, and they routine, routinely underwent an ultrasound of the upper urinary tract and bladder. A total of 280 patients received a neurological workup, and 22% of them had one or more congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract, which we often define as CACUT. The most common findings were kidney arenesie, hypoplasia, of the kidneys, uh, hydronephrosis, vesico-urethral reflux, and duplicated systems. And out of these 22%, 8% needed a um, medical or surgical intervention for their uh, anomaly found. The authors compared their data to the prevalence of CACUT in the general population and found out that it was eight times more likely to occur in patients with Hirschsprung, and they advocate to do a diagnostic urological work up in patients with Hirschsprung by an ultrasound. I came to the end of my presentation and I will finish with some uh, take home messages. Always consider neurogenic bladder when spinal anomalies are present, even with an initial normal evaluation, because things can change during follow up, and follow up is therefore advocated. A normal ultrasound does not exclude fur and 10% still have high-grade fur with therapeutic implication. Despite standardized protocols, incomplete fractal screening is still seen in 15 to 22% uh, of the patients, with potential implications if being unnoticed. Long-term follow-up reveals significant percentage of both lower urinary tract dysfunction and sexual dysfunction in all types of ARM and approximately 20% of patients with Hirschsprung have one or more anomalies of the urinary tract. Sorry for not being able to attend this webinar live, but in case of any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email address uh, shown in the slide. I now give the words to my colleague. So, thank you very much. And I'm really honored that I was invited to present at this joint year-end colorectal webinar series. I'm, uh, um, I'm, I'm working as a pediatric colorectal surgeon, so I'm not a pediatric uh, urologist, and I apologize with all the urologists and pediatric urologists uh, in the audience. And today I'm going to present about uh, uh, epididymitis in patients with anorectal malformation. I'm uh, being uh, the chair of ARNET. Uh, I'm going mainly to present uh, uh, the results of the study that we did uh, within our consortium. Uh, I have nothing to disclose and uh, I will start with uh, some definition. So epididymarchitis is an inflammation of the epididymis and or testicle that to a variety of agents or conditions and epididymitis represents one of the causes of acute scrotum in children and should be distinguished from acute testicular torsion which requires, of course, prompt surgical exploration in order to save the testicle. Concerning the physiopathology of epididymitis, the reflux of urine into the vas deferens is believed to start the inflammation of the epididymis, and the reflux can be either by sterile urine, and in this case, the damage is due to the hyperosmolarity of the urine, or the reflux can be also by infected urine. So, for example, in case of bacterial infection, of residual urine into the urinary or genital tract. So uh, epididymitis has been described in literature in patients with anorectal malformation, and actually literature reports an incidence between 
7.2 and 7.3 percent, which is roughly 10 times higher than in the general pediatric population. And the problem is also that patients with anorectal malformation tend to present uh, recurrent episodes of epididymitis, and recurrent epididymitis may lead to scarring and fibrosis of the testicle. So without proper treatment, epididymitis may result in devastating complications such as infertility. However, the exact etiology and the optimal management in patients with anorectal malformation are still not defined, and only few studies have been published in, the, in literature focusing on the association of anorectal malformation and epididymitis, and these studies are mainly restricted to case reports and short series. And this is probably due to the rarity of the anorectal malformation itself that makes the combination of anorectal malformation and epididymitis even rarer. So uh, this uh, aspect raised the interest of our consortium and we decided to best, better investigate uh, the uh, incidence and the, uh, the possible underlying factors that can predispose to epididymitis in patients with anorectal malformation. And our ARMNET consortium was founded in 2010 and it involves pediatric surgeons, epidemiologists, psychologists, geneticists and representatives of patients' organization and also urologists on specific consultation basis. And the principal aim of our consortium is to exchange data and knowledge and to perform research in order to improve the care of our patients with anorectal malformation. And for any further information, you can visit our website. So we decided to investigate the combination of epididymitis in our patients, and uh, we could publish this paper uh, in 2022 on the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery, and uh, we'll mainly report our results. So the aim of our study was to analyze our experience with the ARM and epididymitis to ideally identify potential risk factors for epididymitis in ARM patients, and to propose a practical algorithm that could be of help for pediatric surgeons and urologists dealing with uh, epididymitis in patients with anorectal malformation. So we perform a retrospective study within our ARNET members and we collected data of male patients with at least one episode of epididymitis in the study period between 2015 and 2019. And we developed a questionnaire to collect data the questionnaire consisted of 27 items that were divided into three uh, sections, one on general information, one on diagnostic, and one on therapy. So we were able to collect data on uh, 29 patients coming from 12 different centers across Europe. And if we analyze our series, we could see that patients who developed episodes of epididymitis were mainly patients with uh, anorectal malformation, type rectourinary fistula, so 90% of patients in our series had an anorectal malformation with rectourinary fistula, which was actually mainly prostatic. The median age of the first episode of epididymitis was two years, but actually we found a very, a very a wide age range from 15 days up to 27 years, and the majority of episodes of epididymitis occurred after PSARP. So 83% of patients had the epididymitis, the first episode after PSARP. We had a total number of 74 episodes of epididymitis in 29 patients, which corresponds to a mean of 2.5 episodes of epididymitis per patient. And the majority of patients present multiple episodes of epididymitis, so 70% had recurrences. There was no site predilection at the first episode of epididymitis, but we noticed that 60% of recurrences were ipsilateral, thus supporting the presence of underlying predisposing factors. If we focus on the associated anomalies, we could find that almost 50% of our patients had some degree of vesicourethral reflux. 41% of patients had urethral anomalies, including hypospadia, urethral stenosis or hypoplasia, urethral duplication and posterior urethral valves. 10% of patients had ectopic vas deferens, and 41% of our patients had neurogenic bladder. Almost one third of patients also had sacral anomalies for tethered cords. 
Concerning the diagnostic that was performed in patients with epididymitis, 45% of patients received urine culture during the episode of epididymitis, and there was quite a high incidence of bacterial infection in our series, so 70% of positive urine culture. Testicular ultrasound was, was performed at the first episode of epididymitis in 79% of patients, while MCUG was performed in 60% of patients. Urodynamics were act was actually performing a very limited number of patients. Only 14% of patients received urodynamics, but the majority of patients who received this investigation had an abnormal finding. Concerning the therapy, for the acute episodes of epididymitis, the majority of patients received antibiotics, while a surgical exploration was performed only in 14% of patients. Concerning recurrences, despite the high incidence of bacterial infection, antibiotic prophylaxis was started only in 20% of patients. And due to recurrent and intractable epididymitis, 30% of patients received surgery, including injection of Viking agent at the site of the Vero Montanum. 10% of patients received vasectomy, 5% Viking agent and vasectomy, and 5% orchiectomy. So if we analyze the predisposing factors in our series, we can state that we can divide our factors between anatomical and functional factors. And these predisposing factors lead to the reflux of urine into the vas deferens. Concerning the anatomical predisposing factors, our series showed that patients with epididymitis had some congenital or acquired urethral anomalies, including hypospadias, posterior urethral valves, urethral strictures, urethral hypoplasia or the duplications, and also we should consider the possibility of iatrogenic damage of the urethra during surgery that can lead to some kind of stricture that can predispose to the reflux of urine into the vas deferens. Ectopic vas deferens is another predisposing factor that can uh, lead to epididymitis, also in patients with anorectal malformation. And there is also a condition which is called persistent mesonephric duct syndrome, where the vas ends directly into the ureter and or into the renal pelvis, therefore predisposing to the reflux into the vas. And specifically in patients with the anorectal malformation, we should remember that the majority of our patients with epididymitis had the rectourinary fistula. And if we focus on this, we could see in our series that five patients developed epididymitis even before PISAR. And all these patients had the rectourinary fistula. Actually, the presence of uh, a colostomy should limit the, the possibility to have an episode of epididymitis because the, the mechanism that is speculated to be responsible in this case is that the urinary fistula can promote the passage of stool or mucus from the bowel into the urinary tract and therefore lead to epididymitis. And the presence actually of a divided colostomy should prevent this. And some authors have speculated that loop colostomy, on the contrary, could predispose to the passage of stool and mucus into the distal bowel, into the fistula, into, and into the urinary tract. But actually, if we analyze our series, all these five patients had a divided colostomy in place. So the divided colostomy, at least in our experience, did not seem to prevent the risk of epididymitis. It would be also interesting to analyze the role of the distal colonic washouts that some patients receive, especially uh, in preparation of uh, surgery. Uh, and some authors have speculated that the distal colonic washouts can promote the passage of bacteria into the urinary tract and therefore can lead to epididymitis. But unfortunately, we did, did not have this data in our series, so we cannot state anything on this aspect. Uh, it is also interesting to see that in our series, anorectal repair with the ligation and division of the rectourinary fistula was curative in terms of recurrences of epididymitis only in 60% of patients. In fact, 40% of our patients had recurrent epididymitis even after the ligation of the fistula. And this suggests the presence of other predisposing factors for epididymitis. So, we really believe that there is a need in all patients with the anorectal malformation and especially in patients with epididymitis to have a complete urologic workup to investigate the predisposing factors. Even after PSARP, uh, patients with rectourinary fistula 
were more keen to develop PPDD mitis. And so we can speculate that the presence of the rectal urinary fistula itself may disturb the anatomy of the verum montanum, especially in the prostatic urethra, and also that surgery for anorectal malformation working very close to the urinary system might interfere with the normal anatomy and functioning of the bladder, prostate, and urethra. And this combination of, of factors can lead to the reflux of urine into the vas deferens. We also have functional predisposing factors that can lead to epididymitis, and these include and have been shown in our series neurogenic bladder and lower urinary tract dysfunction with eye voiding pressures or the trusor sphincter dyssynergia with voiding dysfunctions. And uh, our patient, 50% of our patient presented the associated vesicourethral reflux. And we can also consider the sicoureteral reflux as an indirect expression of voiding dysfunctions. We also notice in our series a very high incidence of bacterial infection compared to patients with epididymitis without anorectal malformation. Uh, and uh, analyzing our series, uh, we could see that in case uh, in the acute episode of epididymitis, the majority of patients receive analgesics, but at the same time they receive antibiotics. And due to the high incidence of bacterial infection, we suggest and we encourage to perform urine cultures to adequately use the antibiotics. We all know that uh, at the time of uh, uh, presentation, in case, of course, of acute scrotum, is very important to rule out uh, testicular torsion. Uh, but we should not uh, underestimate the, uh, the, the correlation and the association between anorectal malformation and epididymitis. So usually in anorectal malformation patients, acute scrotum is due to epididymitis. So we suggest to perform a surgical exploration when testicular torsion is suspected and proven without, uh, um, uh, without taking into account the possibility that uh, the acute scrotum is due to epididymitis. And we believe that it is also important to avoid unnecessary surgery in patients with anorectal malformation who already received many uh, interventions. In case of recurrent epididymitis, we suggest to consider antibiotic prophylaxis, as we have noticed this high incidence of bacterial infection. And uh, it is the most important thing is actually to investigate for underlying risk factors, and as mentioned before. So we strongly suggest to perform a complete urologic workup to elucidate the etiology, so to identify event potential anatomical or functional predisposing factors to treat them, and as final aim to prevent and minimize the risks of recurrences. Uh, this, in our series, in fact, revealed that actually a complete urologic workup was performed in a very limited number of patients. And so our study shows that there is a quite high variability in strategies between different European centers, and this definitely calls for standardization of care. Uh, we should not uh, forget that the um, recurrences of epididymitis can lead to repeated inflammation that can lead to fibrosis and scarring of the testicle and the epididymis, and this destroys the spermatogenic cells. And in fact, in literature, 20% of male infertility has been ascribed to epididymitis. In order to be of help uh, to uh, to, for the pediatric surgeons and for the pediatric urologists, but as well to adult urologists, we decided to develop a diagnostic and therapeutic algorithm. Uh, so in case uh, we have a, a, a first episode of epididymitis in a patient with anorectal malformation, if this occurs before PSARP, we should uh, investigate if the patient has a rectal urinary fistula, which is of course a type of anorectal malformation, and definitely we need to divide the fistula. This can lead only in a limited proportion portion of patients to a resolution of uh, the further episodes. But we have seen in our series that uh, epididymitis can be recurrent even after the ligation of the fistula. So in this specific category of patient, we definitely need a, a complete urologic workup to investigate associated risk factors. And this is also true for patients who do not have a, a rectourinary fistula or for patients who develop epididymitis after PSARP. So we, we suggest to consider antibiotic prophylaxis and to start a complete urologic workup that should include a kidney ultrasound, but at the same time it should be considered to, to perform a kidney scintigraphy if deemed necessary 
and MCUG and Eurodynamics, and we should also consider to perform endoscopy to better investigate for anatomical factors. So if we find a persistent urinary fistula, we definitely need to do a redo surgery and to ligate the fistula again. Uh, if we see that there is an ectopic vas deferens, we need to treat it. Uh, with endoscopy or with a surgical treatment. In case of urethral anomalies, uh, for example, in case of strictures, we need uh, to treat and to relieve the stricture to prevent the reflux of urine into the vas deferens. And of course, in case of neurogenic bladder, we need to treat it with the medical and surgical treatment uh, if it is necessary. And we suggest to consider only in case of persistent and intractable epididymitis, despite uh, the complete urologic workup to consider vas clipping or vas transaction to, um, to protect the testicle for, from fibrosis and scarring. So the take home messages of my presentation are that recurring epididymitis may lead to devastating complications such as infertility and the complete urologic workup is therefore necessary to elucidate the etiology and minimize the risks a clear collaboration between urologists and pediatric surgeons is needed in the multidisciplinary teams for the care of our patients with anorectal malformation. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Anna. Um, so just, just in case anybody's worried, Lucy's voice hasn't changed. I'm just taking over because she had to leave. Um, so um, if you have any questions to ask, uh, please send them through now. Um, as we obviously we mentioned uh, in the beginning of Dr. Deval's presentation. If you have questions specifically for, on that presentation, you hopefully you note it, maybe note it down her email address. You can obviously send them there. If you want to send them through the chat here, you can please do that. But please, it'd be helpful to note them as for Dr. Deval. If you do that. Otherwise, if you have questions for Dr. Morandi, please send them through now. Just give you a couple of moments to start doing that. Um, uh, just a few other notices while we wait for those. Um, so this webinar is accredited. Uh, if you want to claim accreditation, accreditation points, please ensure you fill in the survey, which will be sent out straight after the session ends. Um, anybody, we'd like everybody to fill that in as well, please, because it's useful to have the feedback. Um, it's slightly changed now from what it was previously to accommodate the accreditation. So just to note that. Um, please also note all our future webinars are, will be noted on our website. So please have a look at that if you want to see which sessions are coming up particularly on our colorectal series. Um, anything else I need to say? Um, I think that's it for now. Um, just remember that the webinar has been recorded, so you're able to watch anything back again tomorrow or straight after the session. Actually, if you use the same joining link um, you used to come into this, we'll also send out a new link tomorrow to a slightly tidied up version of the webinar. Okay, um, so we've got one question coming through. I will pass this on to you, Anna, if that's okay. Um, hopefully, we're to see it. Um, so you should see questions now uh, on a, on the side. Uh, yeah, I can see the question, which okay. is: uh, For how long uh, do you recommend antibiotic prophylaxis in children with uh, epididymitis and anorectal malformation? And uh, this is a very good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a, a correct or uh, a clear answer to this. Uh, what we do in our center is to start the antibiotic prophylaxis and to follow the patient, uh, uh, of course, in, during time. And uh, it depends on what we found in the urologic workup. If we have a clear answer that we have a predisposing factor, an anatomical predisposing factor, and we treat it and we think we solve the problem, then we decide to stop the prophylaxis. But we, if we don't have a clear answer on this or if we don't really identify the anatomical or functional predisposing factors, we prefer to continue the prophylaxis even longer. Okay, um, no other questions yet. We'll give everyone like a few more seconds. Um, so just wait for those. Uh, okay, I think. Of course, if anybody thinks of another one has come through, so I'll send this on. Um, so I can see another question. It is, uh, have you had severe cases which you had to clip? Did the symptoms resolve? 
so uh, to answer this question, we have few patients in our series within ARMET that receive uh, VAS uh, clipping or transaction, as I show in the presentation, and uh, uh, we don't have a long follow-up, but uh, uh, by the time we did the study, there were no recurrences. And um, it is speculated if to put a clip or divide uh, uh, and transact the VAS, actually the clip is easier to reverse. Uh, and so it, the literature normally suggests to do it. But of course, you prevent the reflux into the VAS and, and you, you protect the testicle by doing this. Okay. Um, so as well, we'll just wait if anybody wants to ask anything else. Um, give you another 30 seconds or so to ask. Um, so will a question come through? I'll just say, if anybody thinks of uh, questions afterwards, you can still send those through. Either you'll have mine and Lucy's email address, so you can send them through there. Or if anybody's watching this later on on YouTube, please put them into the YouTube comments. We do monitor those, so we will then pass them on at a later date. Uh, so another question that's come through. So usually, when will epididymitis happen after anoplasty? Um, as, as we show in our series, we had the quite a wide age range at the first episode of epididymitis. Some patients had epididymitis very early, before PSARP, as I said, but some patients, for example, had the first episode of epididymitis at 25 or 27 years of life, so there is not a specific timing. Um, and uh, it can happen in, in the entire life, I mean, especially to patients who previously had a rectal urinary fistula. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, so anybody else? I'll give you another few seconds if anybody wants, wants to ask anything. Um, so otherwise, we'll um, you can ask questions later on. Um, just remind again, we'll send out uh, the details tomorrow of the direct links to all registrants. A reminder, please fill in the survey if you can. Um, the question from Alex. It was coming through now. Any experience with deflux to the vas opening? Uh, yes, uh, we had experience within the ARMNET consortium, and this was also useful to prevent the reflux. So we have few patients that receive deflux at the side of the veromontano, but this, of course, is helpful and is less invasive than clipping the vas or transecting it. So it's a good solution. Okay. Uh, Alex says, thank you for that answer. Um, okay, I'm going to <laughs> give everyone a few more seconds and then uh, otherwise we will uh, call this, uh, bring this to an end. Um, everyone's typing quickly if they want to. I mean, okay. unfortunately, if I could just can add, unfortunately, all the studies are based on retrospective uh, studies, so it would be interesting to put together much more cases, ideally on a prospective manner, to, to have better information, better data, and more evidence on this topic. So, unfortunately, the, the experience is limited to retrospective studies. Yes, okay. Um, right, so no other questions have come through in the meantime, so thank you for that, Anna. So thank you very much for doing the presentation today and taking the questions as well. Um, thank you to everybody who uh, attended. Um, if you have anybody has any problems, issues, questions, you have, uh, should have my details or Lucy's details uh, to email us any problems around the uh, accreditation or certificate, certificate of attendance as well that should get sent out with the survey. Um, I think it's actually separate email, but um, yeah, any problems with that, please let us know. Um, so thank you, everybody. So please check our website for future sessions. Um, and yes, thank you again, Anna, for doing this. And uh, um, is there anything you want to finish off by saying? Or uh... I just want to thank you again for the invitation. It was a pleasure to present at this colorectal session. Thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you again for being here. So thank you, everybody. Hopefully, everybody has a good evening, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much, and good evening.